Hey y'all, Scott here. You know, I've made it nine years staying spoiler free on Heavy Rain, and the only way to stay as spoiler free as possible before playing it is to not play it. Christ, I'm only human! Wanna see something that'll make any middle-aged retro gamer who says games were better back in the day wince? As video games evolved, it became clear as day that they could be so much more than Blue Hedgehog versus Obesity. You can make different types of games that defy all the odds of being called a game. They could be interactive stories. You could create a plot that was just as high quality as something out of a book or movie, while also giving the player the ability to make their own choices and affect the outcome of everything. Or they could literally just be a movie playing and you have to hit the right button at the right time. You either love these types of games or you despise these types of games. Fans love how it's like experiencing a movie, but you get to interact with it, and then everybody else thinks they don't really qualify as games, you don't get the same level of control as with a standard video game, it just feels like you're watching a movie and have to press a button sometimes. I'm straight down the middle with my stance on these things. I do prefer playing more standard video game experiences, but I find the interactive movie-like games to have their own merits. They can be just as fun, albeit in a much different way. But to truly understand this type of game, we have to take a look at one of the most notorious games of this nature. Labeled as an interactive drama, here we have Heavy Rain, developed by Quantic Dream. They're well known for the interactive movie experience. They created Fahrenheit, also known as Indigo Prophecy before this, and put out Beyond Two Souls and Detroit Become Human afterward. Directed by David Cage, the game was initially revealed at E3 2006 with a tech demo, Heavy Rain, The Casting. This had nothing to do with the final game. It was created to demonstrate how they were utilizing motion capture to make fake people look like real people. Just a simple video of a casting call audition. The actress here did make it into the final game as a supporting character, but other than that, this is just a taste as to how Heavy Rain would look, and by God did it look. Interactive movie type experience has always had the issue of, you see, I can't take it seriously when it looks like that. Heavy Rain looked almost as good as an actual movie, and because of that, it wasn't until February of 2010 when the game finally released as a PlayStation 3 exclusive. Quantic Dream originally approached Microsoft with the game, but they didn't want anything to do with it due to it involving children being kidnapped. Sony, on the other hand, said, hell yes! Now, it originally released on the PlayStation 3, was later updated for PlayStation Move, and in 2016, it made its way onto the PS4 alongside Beyond Two Souls. The PS4 release was digital only for the longest time here in North America. Over in Europe, they got a double pack of both games, which I consider picking up for the longest time to own this thing physically. However, they ended up releasing physical copies over here in 2018, a part of this $40 box set of Heavy Rain, Beyond, and Detroit. I may eventually play the other two games, but come on. Child abduction. All right, so I played through Yoshi's Crafted World, so now I need a palate cleanser. So why not try Heavy Rain? Oh boy, I can't wait to get depressed. All right, Heavy Rain. We open on a naked man in bed. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ethan Mars, and we're gonna be controlling him in this adventure. Okay, we have to use the right stick to do whatever the game feels like telling us to do, and to move around the environment. We have to hold the right trigger while moving the left stick, and to interact with objects, we use the right stick when prompts come up. I have been waiting so long to finally use this banner. So I physically force Ethan to have no shame and to look at his bird. Nothing screams bird looking more than flicking down the right stick. I can explore the house a bit. Uh, here's Ethan's kid's room. Uh, looks like I can attempt some juggling. Wouldn't it be hilarious to see him mess it up? <sighs> okay, give me one more shot at this. Yes. Moving into the bathroom, it becomes apparent that we not only have to use the right stick and buttons for random actions, but we have to shake the controller as well. I knew all those years of playing were worth something. Various things in the environment in Heavy Rain are completely superfluous to the story. You don't have to interact with lots of this stuff. Uh, for example, you can look at yourself in the mirror just to make Ethan look like a smug son of a bitch and very little else. It's shower time and we see some form of nudity. Yeah, this is all starting to make sense. So Ethan gets all dressed up and it's time to wait for his wife and kids to get back home. I just stared at the door while I waited. Now they're here and now the wife is asking me to grab some plates out of the living room cupboard. Living room cupboard. I've been looking around the living room for five minutes trying to find this thing. Damn it, my marriage is on the line. The cupboard ended up being in the dining room. This is not a living room. That's a dining room. Why is it called the living room cupboard? Let's see how the kids are doing. I picked Jason first since he's my favorite. I start spinning him around. The game cuts to this angle of Ethan. I laugh. Then I play with Sean. These kids think I am a god and will clap at anything. Now it's time to fight Jason. God, I'm kicking this kid's ass. Jesus, they should have called this game Jason f 
fucking dies. So Merlin the bird dies in the span of this to this. Alert, I can't walk away for 20 minutes without the bird dying. I don't know what happened, he just did. Sean runs upstairs, I follow him, dead bird on the ground. Anything could have happened. Well, we move on to a nice family trip to the mall. The kids are going wild. Ethan's wife wants to go look at shoes for Sean while I get some quality Jason time. Oh, damn it, he ran away. Here we have the infamous Jason, Jason. button up here. Hit X for maximum Jason. Jason. I don't call it X, I call Jason. it Jason. I wish other games would follow suit. Jason. So I catch up to Jason. Jason, you really shouldn't wander off like that, you know? There's an awful lot of people in here. Please, Dad, can I have one? What's wrong with you? Don't run away like that just to force me to buy you a balloon. A a damn it, he did it again! Everybody in this Jason! mall is gonna know how loud I can truly say Jason, but seriously, where'd Jason. he go? Oh my god, this crowd is ridiculous, I'm never gonna find it! Oh, here's the food court. Oh, Jason, he's across the street. Why is he across the street? What is he trying to gain from that? So Jason runs towards Ethan in busy traffic and gets hit by a car. Jesus, they should have called this game Jason fucking dies. How did Jason die from this? Ethan was the one getting hit by the car. Look at that. Well, that was the opening. I love video games. They're fun. We got to two years later. Jason's death has taken a toll on everybody. Everything's dark and gray and I can force Ethan to drink an entire bottle of beer and then put it back in the fridge. He is really taking it hard. During this entire scene, I can walk around and interact with random objects or I can talk to my son. I'll just sit here. He has really gone off the deep end. We can hold the left trigger to listen to Ethan's thoughts, one of them being how Sean vastly prefers his mother to him. Yeah, it's like Ethan was responsible for his brother's death or something. Let's make Sean some dinner. The microwave blasts the chicken for five seconds in total and then is done. That is f***ing incredible. And here I am, sitting, watching my son eat. I still don't know why he prefers being around his mother. Time for Sean to go to bed. I go upstairs, I see he drew his brother dying. Oh, that's so... Normal! Ethan and Sean have a heart-to-heart -heart talk about why Ethan looks sad, and Sean makes a very mature statement on how Jason's death wasn't his fault. Okay, two things. One, that's a little weird for him to say after drawing this. And two, this would have been a very powerful moment if the game didn't glitch out and Sean's lips actually moved. You know, Dad, what happened to Jason wasn't your fault. Good night, Sean. So Ethan has a bit of a blackout afterwards, and then... Who the f*** is that? It's the bumbling detective Scott Shelby! We're playing as him now as he visits a mother of one of the victims of the infamous Origami Killer. A murderer who kidnaps children and drowns them in rainwater, an idea Sony just couldn't get enough of. The mother we're visiting is Lauren, and we have to... trick her into telling us about her dead son. She doesn't budge, Shelby has an asthma attack, this guy comes to beat up Lauren, but he gets Shelbied. God bless Scott Shelby. Now on to Norm, a third playable character. Norman Jaden is an FBI agent and a great one at that. He may require a bit of drug snorting, but hey, I mean, he has these cool glasses that reveal all these fingerprints and things. Great stuff. Pretty much after every scene with Norman, he has to take a hit of whatever the hell this thing is. He's not addicted, he just does it every day. I have to bob my head back and forth to look at different things here, but instead I like making Norman go, no, 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 no. Back to Ethan, he's at a psychiatrist psychiatrist and is told he is not responsible for Jason's death. Sure. At the park with Sean now, and it is my mission to have this kid like me more than his mom. You know what that means, time to whip out the secret weapon, take out the boomerang, he'll eat that up. Now that is one happy kid. Ethan, you finally did it. Okay, we're back to sitting on the bench and not talking. And then we're back to having fun, man. Things are finally starting to look up. Ethan and Sean are having a good time, and then Sean just has to bring up his dead brother. We were so close. We were so close! Sean goes on the carousel, and Ethan blacks out again. I play a mini game for Mario and Sonic at the Olympics. Ethan comes back to reality and realizes Sean has gone missing. Now it's time for Norm again. He has to wait at the police station, so he decides to whip out his fancy FBI glasses and plays with a ball. It's good to know the FBI allocates their budget well. We get our own office, and the FBI glasses transport us into a forest to do research. Well, if you were developing FBI glasses, you'd include that feature too. After Norm needs a flavor seizure in his nose, it immediately pans over to Ethan at the police station telling them everything he knows about his missing child. His ex-wife comes in and immediately blames him for Jason's death and Sean going missing. Okay, that wasn't helping the matter at hand and only made Ethan's mental state worse. Scott Shelby is back in the building, everybody! He questions this cashier as he's yet another one of the parents of a victim of the origami killer. Can I help you, sir? That's Mr. Sir to you. My son is dead, Mr. Shelby. Now oh, that's a good place to leave it. I'm just looking around the store and then, uh-oh, robbery! I have to go through a bunch of different things to say to the gunman. I ended up having to tug names with him. My name's Scott. What about you? What's your name? Let's go around the class and introduce ourselves with one fun fact! The gunman gets Shelby and in return the cashier gives us... a box. Thanks. No, it's a box the origami killer sent him. Well, that's our cue to leave, and the whole game could have ended here. 
But now we have to play as our fourth main character, Madison. She can't sleep, various men break into her house, it was all a bad dream. That's about it. Now, you can take a shower in this scene, so there is nudity involved, and not just any nudity. Pointless nudity. Going back to Ethan, he receives a mysterious letter in the mail alongside a locker ticket. He's really thinking this one through. Ethan has another blackout. This time he's around all these people and can kill them with just one touch. There's probably something symbolic about this, but I like touching as many people as I could. That was pretty fun. All right, we're back in reality. It's a good thing I have subtitles on. Ethan receives a box from the origami killer. He gets back to a motel and will open up the box for the first time. This is a big moment in the game, and yes, you can't piss before it. It's obvious Ethan must complete various trials set up by the origami killer to get just the slightest bit of information about his son's whereabouts. Norm time, we're discussing what we know about the origami killer. Not much, but he drowns his victims in rainwater and only when it rains a certain amount. We'll meet with a meteorologist, tell him to stop the rain. Norm and the chief of police go to this one guy's house. He's a nutcase and I shoot him because he's getting hostile. Not sure if that was the best decision I could have made there. Ethan goes to the first trial given to him by the origami killer and has to drive against traffic for a period of time, and the madman actually does it. The car does blow up, but we get some clues to Sean's location. Madison goes to stay at a motel and runs into old Ethan Mars after playing a quick game of red light, green light. She helps him out because he's an obvious pain, and then Ethan's off to suffer some more in the next trial, but first, he's back, folks! My least favorite character to play as! Norman's pouting after killing that one guy, but then chases a criminal on foot, my favorite video game scene to add funny sound effects to. Shelby is loafing around the office and goes to... Ah, sh**. One of, one of those big white boxes. They keep food cold. Oh, oh yeah, the fridges. Lauren comes back and we have ourselves a new partner in crime. We head to a party to question this guy watching cartoons. This guy goes on about how he is in fact the origami killer. Snaps his goons to take care of Shelby. They get Shelbied. And now Ethan arrives at the power plant for his next trial. I never knew how much I wanted a heavy rain 2D platformer until now. It looks like I have to crawl on this broken glass. This was a bad day to wear cargo shorts. After the long period of glass crawling, now Ethan has to weave his way through all this electricity. This is one of the most unique aspects of Heavy Rain's gameplay, how it forces you to hold down various buttons and some of the button combinations you have to do are really awkward, which makes this scene much more tense. Alright, I praised Heavy Rain and that should do it for today. So after that, we have more clues to the address of your missing child's location. Yes, I love riddles. Madison notices Ethan lying in bed and decides to help him out. Cause she's just such a great person. Even after noticing the origami figures on his desk, which could imply he is in fact the origami killer, she still helps him out. Cause she's just such a great person. Now it turns out that Ethan's ex-wife is telling the police she thinks Ethan's acting weird. Well no sh**! One son's dead, the other's been kidnapped! She's saying how, since he's acting weird, he may be the origami killer. Shelby visits this guy's father and is just like, is he the killer? Is he? And now Ethan. His next trial is to... cut off one of his fingers. F that! Ethan doesn't cut off one of his fingers and leaves. Madison follows Ethan and just as he's leaving, the police are outside ready to arrest him. Madison helps Ethan escape. Cause she's just such a great person. But Ethan gets arrested, he gets questioned but doesn't budge. I don't even remember if there was a rule that he can't tell anybody what the origami killer was telling him to do. But even then, I feel like if he gave all the information he has to the police, they'd be able to find Sean without Ethan potentially cutting off his finger, but you know, whatever. Beardy's confident that Ethan is the killer, but Norm isn't. He even goes into a simulation to play piano badly, telling his virtual butler all his problems. Norm lets Ethan escape because he's confident that Ethan's telling the truth when he says he's the only one who can save his son. Shelby visits a typewriter salesman because the origami killer used a typewriter to type his letters. They really have nothing better to do. But the origami killer kills the typewriter salesman because they were snooping too much. On the way home, I have to come up with a response to Lauren. Uh, this one. You're gonna be a good girl, you're gonna go home, and let me get on with my investigation. What the hell was that? Ethan has to kill a man for his next trial. Now, well, because I skipped out on the last one, I guess I have to. Madison does some investigating on her own, going to this one guy's house who knocks her out and tries to operate on her. Never trust a man with a Hawaiian shirt. Lauren comes up with an idea, cross-checking everybody who had a typewriter fixed and who subscribed to origami magazines. And they come across the name John Shepard, a kid who died years ago. It's revealed John Shepard died by drowning. We play as his brother in this flashback sequence. Maybe the brother turned out to be the killer and was using John's name all these years. All right, we're gonna have to speed run the ending. Madison goes to this club to question this guy renting apartments from this freak. Norm goes to the same club, but comes after the origami killer came to kill this guy because he was talking too much. Norm gets into a scuffle with the guy, but he escapes. I feel like there was probably a way to get more information from that. Maybe some security cameras. 
Madison goes back to the motel to find Ethan. He says how he had to kill a man, and they bone. What? Ethan finds out Madison's a journalist who was only talking to him for a story. He forgives her. Ethan runs away from the police. Shelby and Lauren get disposed of by that one guy's dad. Shelby swims, Lauren dies, and he seeks revenge by storming into the guy's home and killing every single security guard. He does save him from having a heart attack at the end, though. He has a heart of gold. Madison talks to the mom of John Shepard, and though she has Alzheimer's, she gets her to remember her other son's name. Now Ethan's at his final trial. He has to drink poison and will only have one hour before he dies, so he has to rush to his son with the final address. Okay, oh I better get a trophy for this. Norm does more investigating, and it turns out the origami killer and John Shepard's son this entire time was Scott Shelby. He can't be the killer, he has asthma! He poses as a private detective and talks to the families of the victims to gather all the evidence he can to dispose of it. I've heard much worse evil schemes. Madison enters Shelby's place and is locked into his vault as he burns it to the ground. Madison enters the fridge as the place gets nuked, calls Norm to tell him the killer was Scott. I didn't even know she had his number. Ethan makes it to save Sean and Shelby gets normed. I save Sean and Shelby falls into this thing. Everybody has a happy ending in my playthrough. Ethan and Madison get together. Scott Shelby is totally dead. Norm gives up pixie sticks and is on a talk show. Oh, and the poison Ethan drank apparently just wasn't poison and he lived. And that was Heavy Rain. Now, everybody's playthrough is a bit different with this game. The game doesn't just end if a certain character dies or you make a bad decision or whatever. I think I got one of the better overall endings. Uh, sure, Lauren died, but... But to answer the question, did I like Heavy Rain? I have no idea. Did I enjoy my time with this game? Yes. Did I enjoy it for the reasons David Cage wanted me to enjoy? Oh god no. I would love to take this game seriously. But it's just too damn silly. How did Jason die from this? Why is Sean so happy in my ending? This is him after not only his brother dying, but him being tortured for days on end. He was way more depressed before being kidnapped. Wouldn't this scar him even more? Why was Ethan escaping from the police station so easy? He is literally the main suspect of the biggest crime going on at the moment. And how come nobody ever asks how he escaped? Norm gets off the hook. How did Shelby lay out all this broken glass wreath to crawl through? The man's the size of a small house and the glass goes in multiple directions in this tiny tunnel. If Scott Shelby was trying to keep the police off his ass by destroying any and all evidence of his murders, why would he crash his car into this guy's house and kill all these security guards just to tell this guy to back off? Also, he's just now starting to collect evidence years after he murdered those kids? Why didn't the parents give the evidence to the police when the murders actually happened? I enjoyed my time with this game because it was never boring to me. It was always entertaining and I did like the twist. But the story as a whole, wasn't that great? Most of the characters I hated. I thought Ethan was kind of dumb. His wife was absolutely insufferable. Madison was okay, but I felt you could have taken her out of the story and it would have been the same. I found Norman boring and it breaks my heart that my favorite character ended up being the killer. As a movie-like video game, I think the plot being able to branch off in multiple different directions makes it pretty okay for a video game story in 2010. But here's the thing. As a video game, this ain't that great. As a movie, this is garbage. However, I think it works well enough as an interactive drama. Well, my obsession with Heavy Rain's lame characters has really taken a toll on my life these past few days. I have not cleaned my kitchen in days. I'll leave it like that. See, leaving garbage on a floor is a smart way to know if you have rats in the house. I'll know if I have rats if the garbage gets eaten.